Hi, I'm Jamsi. I'm a finance professor and welcome to another video. So for today, we're going to be continuing our discussion on mortgage markets. So the last video discussed about the different characteristics of a mortgage. And we have mentioned that one of the ways in which we can actually pay off a mortgage is through mortgage amortization. So let's recap that a little bit. So what is mortgage amortization? Mortgage amortization is the fixed monthly payments made by the borrower that generally consists of the partial repayment of the principal and interest on the outstanding balance of the loan. So how do we know how much of our monthly payments goes through the principal and the interest payment. It is through the use of an amortization schedule because the amortization schedule shows us how the monthly payments are broken down between the principal and the interest. So in this particular slide, this is an actual amortization for a vehicle. And as you can see here, there are 27 payments made from July 2019 to August 2021. And further on the table, you will notice that there is a fixed amount of payment every month. But you would notice that for every month, the allocation towards the principal payment varies as well as the interest payments. So in this particular table, you will notice that interest is calculated on the basis of days. And after paying for the interest first, the excess of the monthly fixed payment will then be allocated towards the principal. And furthermore, you will notice that as you go along the payment term, the allocation towards the principal payment becomes larger. So at the early stages of an amortization, we can assume that we are first prioritizing the payment of interest. So once the interest payments are sufficiently covered, then the payment is allocated subsequently to the principal. So here is a manual formula on how you can compute for the present value of a mortgage using the present value formula where TV is equal to the principal amount being borrowed, PMT is equal to the monthly mortgage payment, R is the monthly interest rate on the mortgage, and T is the number of monthly payments over the life of the mortgage. So here's a quick example. You plan to purchase a house for $150,000 using a 30-year mortgage obtained from your local bank. The mortgage rate offered to you was 8%. You decide to make a 20% down payment to forego the purchase of a property mortgage insurance at closing. So, in this particular illustration, we need to remember a few things. 
in this particular illustration, we are reminded, first and foremost, that we are required to purchase a property mortgage insurance if we are planning to make a down payment of less than 20%. But if we want to forego the purchase of the property mortgage insurance, then we must make at least a 20% down payment. All right? So I hope that is clear. Secondly, the purchase price of this house is at 150,000 US dollars. So is that the same amount that you are going to apply for in the mortgage? Of course not. Because out of the $150,000 of the purchase price, you're already paying 20% of that up front. Therefore, the principal amount of the loan currently is at 80% of the purchase price of the house. So in this regard, we can compute that at 150000 times 80% or as shown on screen, this is 150000 minus the quantity 150000 times 20%, which gets us to $120,000. So this is the amount that you are going to apply for in your mortgage in order for you to be able to purchase the house at $150,000. So how do we compute the monthly payment? So we use the formula on screen. Now, we can actually substitute. So, we are looking for PMT. And obviously, we already know the value in the other side, which is 120,000 US dollars. So, we apply based on the given. So, that's going to be 120,000 equals the monthly payments, which in, in this case is X. And then you plug in the R value and the T value. So I want you to pay close attention to the T value or the number of months that it will take us to fully pay this loan. So, our given says that this mortgage is going to last for 30 years. And for the period of 30 years, you are going to make monthly payments. So, in order for, for us to get the correct T value or the term of the mortgage, we simply multiply 30 years times 12 months. That gets us to the correct T value of 360. Now, let's go and examine the R value. Ma'am, in the given, we are offered an 8% annual rate. Do we apply it annually? No. Because we also have to state the interest 
on a monthly basis because it has to be parallel with the number of months that it will take us to pay for the loan during the year. So if the total interest that we pay on a yearly basis is 8%, we divide that number by 12 to get our monthly equivalent. So if that's 8% divided by 12, then that equates to the number that you see on screen where it's 0 0.006667. Of course, this is expressed as a decimal and not as a percentage. So now that we have broken this down, we can substitute the values according to the formulas up top right here. So, 120,000 equals PMT times the quantity 1 over 1 plus 0 0.006667 raised to 360 all over 0 0.006667. Let me repeat that. So that's $120,000 equals X or the PMT times the quantity 1 minus the quantity 1 over 1 plus 0, 0, 6, 6, 6, 7, raised to 360 months divided by 0. 0.00. 667. So by virtue of <clears throat> extrapolation, we actually get the value of $880.52. So this is a pretty tedious formula to do on a monthly basis, especially when your um, mortgage term is as long as 30 years. So, we have prepared an amortization table using an Excel spreadsheet. So, if you are looking to solve for this particular problem and you have the spreadsheet available to you. You can actually use the PMT formula in Excel. And you can actually also find this value out using the goal seek function in Microsoft Excel. Now, what does that particular Excel spreadsheet look like if you organize that it's going to look like this so as we can see here we have neatly labeled everything we have identified the loan principal we determine the annual interest rate to be eight percent so it's clear the number of years to pay the monthly interest rate, so meaning that's 8% divided by 12, as was previously mentioned, and the number of months to pay, that's going to be 30 years times 12 months. So, if you already know how much you're going to be paying monthly, you can actually automate this particular table. So we know that for month one, we have the beginning loan balance of 120,000 US dollars. And for month one, we are supposed to make a payment of $880.52. Now, 
how do we know the amount of interest allocated in this regard? So we just multiply 120,000 by the monthly interest rate so that we get the interest payment allocation and then the rest will be allocated towards the principal. So, let's break that down. For month one, we paid $880.52. How did we get the interest payment allocation of $800 according to this table? That's simply 120000 times the monthly interest rate of 0.6667% which will get us to the number $800.04. Of course, I had to round it down. And then, whatever the excess of the interest allocation, which is, in this case, $80.52, would be deducted against the principal loan balance. Thus, we get an outstanding balance at the end of year or month number one, I am so sorry, of $119,919.48. Now, the outstanding balance at the end of month one becomes the outstanding or the beginning loan balance for month number two. We undertake the same process. We multiply $119,919.48 by 0.6667% and we get the interest payment allocation of $799.46. We subtract that from the monthly payment of $880. And 52 cents, and we get a principal payment allocation of 81.06. Thus, we get at the end of month two the outstanding balance of $119,838.42. So, let's recap this a little bit. So, as was shown in the few slides ago, we see here a trend. In the early stages of our mortgage repayment, we notice that much of our monthly payment is allocated towards the principal. But as we move along our payment term, we notice that as the payment or the allocation towards the interest portion of the debt decreases, the allocation towards the repayment of the principal amount of debt increases. So, of course, this particular table ends at month 24. There is still a long way to go until we get to month 360. So for you to be able to build this particular amortization schedule, a video has been separately shared in your Canvas accounts. So I hope you are refreshed by the process of building an amortization schedule. So up next, we have the other types of mortgages because yes we don't just cater to primary mortgages we also cater or the u.s market rather also caters to other types of mortgages and let's go through them one by one so what are these other types of Mortgages. So we have what we call 
in the U.S. as jumbo mortgages. So when something is classified as a jumbo mortgage, these mortgages typically exceed the conventional mortgage conforming limits set by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. So for everyone's information, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are usually the um, regulatory bodies that um, set the limits of these particular mortgages in the U.S. So if something is classified as a jumbo mortgage, it means that this particular mortgage is not your average mortgage in terms of size. All right? So, second, we have subprime mortgages. So, these types of mortgages come from borrowers that had a weak credit history. So, a few years back, uh, we all felt when we all felt it when the U.S market suddenly crashed because of the subprime mortgage crisis. Now, what happened here? During this time, this was, I believe, back in 2010, um, these mortgages or the real estate market in the U.S. was really booming and people were really starting to buy houses at a lower cost. Of course, because the interest rates were enticing, people were also enticed to get their new homes. So because these people are basically subject to lesser stringent background checks or um, information verification. These mortgage lenders or these lending companies unfortunately made dealings with people who had weak credit history. Now, for you to understand, in the U.S., everything hinges on a person's credit history. So if you have a good credit history, it's highly likely that they will give you a good rate for your loans. So what type of loans are we talking about here? We're talking about your vehicle loan. We're talking about your car loan or any other item that you're planning to buy on credit. They will usually run a credit check and see how credit worthy the applicant is. So if you have a weakened credit history, obviously your rates should be different from those with sterling credit history. But unfortunately, majority of the people in the United States at that time had weak credit history, meaning they are not as credit worthy as these lending companies would hope. So what happened? So when the financial crisis hit and a lot of people actually lost their jobs, obviously, there was a domino effect because a lot of people have lost their jobs. They were unable to pay for their mortgages. Therefore, they were forced to default on their loans because there was a large number of people defaulting on their home mortgages during this time the real estate 
market collapsed in the U.S. and it caused a financial crisis. So if you want to look up subprime mortgages, feel free to Google about it. Another type of mortgage is what we call the alt a mortgage. So the alt a mortgage, meaning the alternative a mortgage, is considered riskier than a prime mortgage and less risky than a subprime mortgage. So how do we put that or how do we visualize that in terms of tiers? So at the very top, we have the prime mortgages. These are the mortgages that um, are undertaken with people who have a good credit history, who has well-verified information and whatnot. After that, you go down one level and you get the alt a mortgage. So why are these types of mortgages considered riskier than the prime mortgages but less riskier if you compare it to a subprime mortgage? Alt a mortgages are actually riskier than the prime mortgages because they have less than full documentation, lower credit scores, and higher loan-to-value ratios. So obviously, they are not the ideal clients because they are missing a few of the necessary documentation. They have a decent credit score but they're not the credit scores that the lending companies would like. And oftentimes, these Alt-A mortgages have higher outstanding balances compared to the subprime mortgages. So if you're going to rank prime, Alt-A, and subprime mortgages, it would have to be in that order. So at the very bottom, you have to be most wary about if you are a lending company about these subprime mortgages more than your out a mortgage. So, the last type of mortgage that we are going to discuss is the option ARMs. So, Option ARMs, as the name suggests, allow us to pick a payment or option on the adjustable rate mortgages, which we have discussed uh, in the last video. So in the option ARMs, minimum payment option is allowed, interest-only payment, a 30-year fully amortizing payment or 15-year fully amortizing payment. Second, mortgages or reverse annuity mortgages are allowed. So, I know this sounds like a mouthful, but let's distinguish one from the other. When we say that we choose the minimum payment option. Obviously, you are just supposed to pay the lowest amount possible. So the minimum option payment is the lowest or the cheapest among the options that you see on your screen. The monthly payment on this particular adjustable rate mortgage is initially set for 12 months at an initial interest rate. So it means that for the first 12 months of your mortgage, you are locked in with a specific amount of money that is pegged to an initial 
interest rate. After that first 12-month period, the payment changes annually. And the payment limit or the payment caps will dictate how much it can increase during the year. However, choosing the minimum payment option may result in what we call a negative amortization. So in an amortization, your goal is to actually pay off the debt. But if you're only choosing to pay or if you're only choosing the minimum payment option, then it is very, very possible that the minimum payment option is negatively affecting the way you are amortizing your loan. Because if the rate actually increases and you still end up paying the minimum amount, therefore, you're going to have a harder time to actually pay off the debt. On the other hand, the interest-only option requires the borrower to pay only the interest during the initial period of the loan. So during the initial period of the loan under the interest-only payment, obviously, no principal payment is required. So therefore, under the second option for the ARMs, initially, you're only focusing on paying the interest. No need to pay the principal. But after the initial period, the borrower must then start to amortize so that the mortgage will actually be paid at the end of its term. So through the interest-only option, you are front-loading the payment of interest. So you are actually fully paying or fully allocating the monthly payments towards the interest. And after that initial period, you proceed with the regular amortization so that you ensure that by the time your mortgage comes to term or your mortgage matures, it is actually fully paid. All right? So, on the other hand, we have the 30-year and the 15-year fully amortizing payments. So, in these two option ARMs, what differs or what varies is just the term. One is good for 30 years and one is good for 15 years. So, in both cases, the borrower pays principal and interest over the selected pay period, meaning you can either pay the principal and the interest for 30 years or 15 years. The payment amount of the mortgage will be calculated each month based on the prior month's fully indexed rate, loan balance, and remaining long term. So, what happens here? What's the main difference? In the 30-year fully amortizing payment, you base your payments depending on the balance of the loan, the remaining long term, and the prevailing rate in the market. What's the difference between the 15-year um, fully amortizing payment aside from the period? Obviously, with a shorter payment period, 
under the 15-year fully amortizing payment, we are expected to pay a higher amount of principal payment every month, including the repayment of interest. All right? Because you are actually trying to extinguish the debt at a much lesser or at a much shorter time period than you know the rest of the people who choose the 30 year fully amortizing payment all right second to the last type of mortgage we have the second mortgage so second mortgages exist as loans secured to a piece of real property that was already used to secure a first mortgage. So, interest rates in a secondary mortgage is obviously higher for the second mortgage because obviously, those who act as the secondary mortgagers only get paid after the first mortgage entity has been paid. So that is why they will charge for far more higher interest rates because of the added level of risk that they carry. All right? So if in case there is a default on the loan and a property has a second mortgage. Who gets paid first? Obviously, the first mortgage gets paid first. And whatever is left over after the settlement of the first mortgage will be allocated towards the repayment of the second mortgage. So, usually, financial institutions often offer home equity loan that let customers borrow a line of credit secured with a second mortgage on their homes. So, what does this mean? As we continue to improve on our house, the inherent value of the home or the home equity starts to actually increase. And because of the existing improvements of the house where we live in, the added value of the home improvement becomes the basis for the second mortgage. Last, we have the reverse annuity mortgage. So in the reverse annuity mortgage, as the name suggests, the mortgage borrowers instead of paying, will receive regular monthly payments from a financial institution. So instead of them paying the financial institution for the mortgage, they're the actual, uh, they're the ones who are actually receiving money. When the reverse annuity mortgage matures or the borrower dies, the borrower or the estate of the borrower will have to sell the property to settle the debt. So these reverse annuity mortgage are designed so that the retired homeowners will be able to live on the equity they built up on their homes without having to necessarily sell their homes. So basically what we're seeing here is that the reverse annuity mortgage allows these retirees to live off the value of their loans for uh, or the value of their homes rather for as long as they live and then settle the 
amount of the accumulated debt because in uh in this regard they're actually using the value or they're actually advancing the value of their home and um using it as a pension essentially to support their daily living so once the homeowner or the borrower expires or the reverse annuity mortgage matures they will have to now sell the property and ensure that the the proceeds of this particular sale will be used to settle the reverse annuity mortgage debt that was accumulated all right so that ends part three of our lesson on the mortgage markets until next time i'll see you then bye